Hey, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Br Born Under Punches. We're back here at Born Under Punches. Uh, my name is Tanner. Beyond the Punches. Beyond the Punches. Beyond uh, Punches. Um, my name is Tanner. Uh, I am the shipwreck eradicator uh, on the show. <laughs> and we're talking about uh, we're talking about was it the, like the like the cringiest thing we did uh, freshman year? Is that what we were talking about? Yeah, something like that. Lamest thing you did in lamest lamest thing I did. Lamest thing I did in college. Um, there's a laundry list of things. The one I, the, I guess this is representative of my behavior in college. We were at a a party uh, at at like the the rich person uh, on campus apartment. We were there. And me and some friends were we found ourselves in the kitchen where everybody else is in the living room. And there was a bottle of it wasn't even something super expensive, but it was expensive to us. It was like it was probably like Grey Goose or something that's like not super fancy. But anyway, um, and I had an empty canteen in my pocket because uh, I always carried that around with me because I was a raging alcoholic. Um, and so I emptied like most of the rest of the bottle into my canteen to take with us. Um, and then when the owners of the apartment came back in, they're like, how did we lose all this gray goose? And we just kind of like dipped out. Uh, and my excuse being to, to justify my behavior to my friends who I could tell thought it was kind of cringy. I told them if you live in this apartment, if you can afford, if you can afford gray goose, you can afford more gray goose is what I said. So that was my, that was my excuse. Um, that Not was wrong. my, that was my, I like that line though. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right. Um, so that was my uh, justification for my shitty behavior. Not that that was not objectively the lamest thing I did, but that is pretty representative of the kind of stuff. So I can I can appreciate that action to be honest. I feel like you can use that in any situation. Like you were in the light. Like yeah. if you can afford a car, you can afford another car. You can car. afford another like, one, yeah. <laughs> exactly. So that's that's how I live my life still. Um yeah. so yes, of course, with me also is Kelly. You can if you can afford a baby, you can afford another baby. <laughs> Is that a direct quote from Stolen Miracle? The popular Christmas movie that's on like all the shitty channels during Christmas? Sure. <laughs> yeah, uh my name is Kelly. Uh, my job on the show is to lick the envelopes. And the lamest thing I did in university. Maybe stop me if this is a cop out, but I feel like the lamest thing I did was like not do anything interesting. Like I didn't live on campus. I didn't really like participate in like the school life. I didn't join any like our extracurricular stuff. I like I did a shocking amount of like rushing home to the suburbs to play Minecraft. So <laughs> I, I I feel like that fits the definition of doing like incredibly lame stuff. Because I think that like the only lame things that really come to mind that I actively did were just, I mean, kind of in line with what you were saying, Tanner, but basically just like being uh, a very like unpleasant and creepy drunk. And that's just like, there's nothing funny <laughs> about that. So yeah. As opposed to now where I'm an unpleasant drunk, but I'm not creepy. Mm -hmm. Oh, there you go. <laughs> that's a step up. Yeah. And uh, with me today is Josh. How you doing? Uh, Josh, the resident master debater, who uh, Classic. I thank you, thank you. Uh, the cringiest thing I did in college, which I thought was hilarious at the time, which I think speaks <laughs> to it, uh, was uh, sitting in a French class with someone else in this chat who shall not be named, and uh, making fun of the tryhard student the entire oh. time. <laughs> Owie. <laughs> Yeah, sat there in my pajamas, usually hung over and just made fun of the people who actually wanted to get better at the language. I think uh, in French class, that's called a très hard. <laughs> <laughs> and speaking of très hard, oh, it's not time to pivot to the segment. Never mind. <laughs> and finally, bringing up the anchor here is our friend Nicole. Okay. Brace yourselves. Um, so uh, my name is Nicole. I am the resident dog watcher of the group, <laughs> which was I was planned to say before, when the dogs were still in frame. Yeah, I don't believe you. But I don't see any not. dogs. <laughs> there have not been dogs even once since Nicole turned her camera on. <laughs> I would show you. I can show you the dog. There's one. This is tremendous for anyone who's going to be listening to the audio version. Exactly, right? <laughs> 
There's one directly under my feet. He's curled up under the desk and it's very sweet. Um, I'm not going to disturb him. Um, but the lamest thing that I did in college and I, (laughs) this is the first time I've ever admitted this out loud. Hell yeah. Was of course tried to get into like a foray of political activism. Um, and so I joined the young conservatives. I tried to start a Coney 2012 protest at my university. <laughs> oh, nice. nice. Like sincerely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, nice. no one, no one, no one joined. I was like, tried to reach out to a bunch of people and be like, we should do this. And everyone was like, I think that's a dumb idea. And they were right. Can I throw in another, uh, just another, not cringy on my part necessarily, um, but it involves getting politically active in, in college. Uh, freshman year, trying to, trying to join uh, clubs and stuff, uh, young, impressionable, just out of, uh, just out of high school. So we went to a meeting, me and two of my friends, we went to a meeting of, uh, young Americans for Liberty, uh, which is a libertarian, uh, organization. Hell yeah. So yeah, like, this is going. We, we went there and like the first thing they, they did was, uh, like walking in the door, they gave everyone a copy of Ayn Rand's, um, oh. uh, I forget what it's not, head. it's, it's not one of her. No, it's way too big to hand out. Um, uh, Probably the, a uh, of hers or something. Shit, it was a smaller one, but it wasn't like one of her super popular ones. Um, it's it was one that's more like philosophy than like one of her no- novels. Okay. Um, so we sit down, they're talking, and like for most of the time, a lot of the stuff they're talking about, like okay, like cool, we're like college students, we're open minded, whatever. And then they get to where like two of like the hardened veterans of the of the group, like the president and the chancellor, whatever. Um, they they're discussing ideas of what the group should do this uh this year and the one of them says what if we debate the anti-sweatshop group and <laughs> and the president he, he's like he's like well 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 i don't know um let's see everyone here is pro sweatshop right <laughs> and like kind of like looked at look at my two friends my roommate and, and my friend and like legitimately thought he was saying this like as it's like a sarcastically yeah. like it's like oh yeah of course everyone's pro sweatshop but like no he was dead ass straight face like oh everyone here's pro sweatshop God. and and just a lot of like murmurs and like like nods and stuff and it's like mm-hmm, yeah yeah and yeah, then of and then they're like oh yeah it's like maybe yeah maybe we could maybe we could talk to them and, and hook something up and so as me and my friends were leaving the meeting we were discussing the fact that like you know if if you engage the anti-sweatshop debate or group in a debate like even if you win that debate technically <laughs> you lose because now yeah. you are like that's you're no longer the young americans for liberty you're now the young americans for sweatshop. sweatshops so yeah we didn't go back to that group uh um, good lord yeah. yeah good christ but we tried we tried to get involved yeah but that's uh whoo that's tremendous. That's a, I'm so glad you shared that. Even my like very conservative parents are very anti sweatshop. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I can't say that. That's my a brave parents, stance for them. Too. Yeah, I know, that's, right? Yeah, that's that's like not an acceptable stance to have. You can like at best see it as like, oh, well, this is like a necessary evil, and it gives them more money than they would otherwise. But like, no one's pro sweatshop. Yeah, no one's like, you know, <laughs> like, they need more sweatshops. Yeah. More so, kids in the mines. That was my that was my <laughs> my my first and only attempt to become politically active in any way. So I I like that you asked, like, can I share this? And immediately started sharing it without waiting for permission. And I think that is the true libertarian spirit. Exactly. <laughs> like I learned I learned from the best. So yeah. That one meeting you went to really stuck stuck yeah. to you. Well, clearly, yeah. That blows all our stories out of the water, I think. <laughs> you blow so again, you not, shop. not something that I did that was cringy, but something, go figure, that the libertarians did that was cringy. I, I mean, it's a little cringy that you showed up. It counts. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that's true. I did. I did accept their Ayn Rand uh, uh, book. So that that's cringy in itself. Yeah. I, I uh, thought it was going to be something along the lines of like age of consent because I know always know that's a weird thing with weird libertarians. We should, de- but we should debate the age of consent group. I mean, again, would not shock me with libertarians. Um, the virtue of selfishness is the book that they were. Oh, out. okay, yeah, that sounds like a nice libertarian, like yeah. laissez-faire capitalist piece of literature right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, the libertarian at work. When I was asked, I was talking about books that I wanted to read, and uh, one of them was an Ayn Rand book. I think it was The Fountainhead. And I was oh like, no, 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 no! 
I tried. I tried to listen to it so that I could tell him how bad it was because I was like, I want to give this a fair, fair-ish chance. I'm going in heavily biased, but I want to give it a fairish chance and so that I can come at him and be like, no, this book sucks. But I listened to like the first couple chapters and I was like, this is the most boring shit I've ever heard in my life and I don't want to finish it. <laughs> when I was flirting with libertarianism before that meeting, because that pretty much ended it for me. Winking at <laughs> libertarianism <laughs> across I, the bar. I read... Uh, <laughs> Uh, I read a there's a a libertarian themed sci-fi novel called The Probability Brooch. Okay, anyone ever heard of this? No? I don't think no, I but it sounds it's it's it absolutely terrible. sounds like a... it was awful. Um, but yeah, I read. I think there's a sequel too. Uh, but uh, the the whole thing centers around like the whiskey rebellion in American history, where like if the federal government hadn't stepped in to put down the whiskey rebellion, like during Washington's first term how it would have radically changed U.S. history and made it more, I guess, libertarian. So so it's if that hadn't happened and then like if more of like a decentralized libertarian style government had sprouted up. And so what I was going to say is that you were looking for books to add to your 25 for the year. And I think one of them should be The Probability Brooch by L. Neil Smith. I don't think I want to want to listen to that one or read it or whatever. You need to open your mind. To I need to open philosophies, my mind. <laughs> I think. That's uh, my dad recently told us he wanted us to watch a movie. He was like, it was very bad. I want you to watch it so you can <laughs> just also tell me about how bad it is. So he can hear, he wants to hear why we think it's bad. And I keep telling him that he's reminding me of the time that my brother in home ec made cookies, but accidentally put salt instead of sugar. Oh. And he brought them home and he was like, they're awful. Have one. <laughs> so, yeah, this is the salt cookie of books. You have book recommendations. Yeah, no kidding. That's <laughs> oh man. And speaking I... of salty cookies. Uh oh. Here we go. <laughs> Good lord. Oh, sorry. One more small detail. That uh that book is in a series called the North American Confederacy series, if oh that gives God. you any indication. <laughs> of course. Anyway. <laughs> that's enough of that. <laughs> Well, I already shot load my load on my segue, so someone else has to go. Uh, I'm in my segue refractory period. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of an awful time, time for some erotica. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and cue up the theme song here. Now, the I think that you know creative writing was gonna become a segment after the little you know movie script we did. So, but I don't have a. Uh, segment theme for the writing segment yet so i think we'll just play the erotica theme that really saves us i think that saves us a lot of time oh it's time for the erotica ha, ha, ha. we're gonna learn about a dildo guess where it goes welcome to the love spot you know i feel like this this segment is reaching its middle age and when you reach your middle age you have to find ways to spice things up you have to bring you know some whipped cream into the bedroom so rather than just kind of going through the the missionary motions of just reading from our big stack of books here it seems like the best thing to do was to try and write our own which everyone but nicole was happy to do <laughs> now in, in fairness nicole did read the first uh homemade piece of erotica in this show so i do i guess you got a pass on that First and you could, second, I believe. You could just reread that one, so. <laughs> you know what? I might have it right I, here. I like this. This is like a cottage industry erotica. Um, yeah. You know, more of a local handcrafted erotica. Yeah. Straight from the buy, source. Buy local, because if you, un, like, if you knew the carbon footprint of importing your erotica from, I don't know, like Japan. Like, it's just, it's terrible. And a lot of that erotica is made in sweatshops, so you don't... <laughs> Which we're all, we're all pro-sweatshop here. And everyone here, is, that's a good thing, right? Because everyone here is pro-sweatshop. Well, I don't have erotica here, but I did open up a notebook that's sitting on the table here at the desk that um, has a list in it titled Things to Get My Dick Hard. So maybe I'll, see, I'll ask Ryan's permission to maybe read that later. <laughs> <laughs> yep all right so who's starting with their creative works today what, what, what's our plan here should we roll for it i don't have dice but you can roll for me kelly yeah well i, I got a I great gotta board <laughs> i know uh i'm gonna go from 
in order of cameras here, so I'm going to do Tanner first. Okay. Got a nice four. little four there. And then I'm going to do Josh. Five. Five. Are we going in ascending or descending order? Yeah. I would say highest number starts. All right. And then uh, we're going to go Nicole. Also Another four. four. Wait, no, Nicole didn't do one, so. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then me. So you're starting, Kelly, and then I All guess right. I go next. Okay, so uh, my piece that I wrote. Um, well, first we should see your face there, Kelly. Oh no, I, I think I just really want to dwell on the the dice cam and how those cool little sloping bumpers now force everything into the camera view. Let's just take a moment to appreciate it. I don't. I don't know if we should. All right. So I, I've had the misfortune of flipping through a frankly unforgivable amount of romance novels and just other weird books trying to mine for content. And I've definitely noticed a lot of patterns. So I kind of decided to try and see if I could write a sort of maybe the just a platonic form of the romance novel of like really the themes they go through and what they like to focus on and in particular the one kind of i guess i would say body part that they shockingly seem to come back to no makes sense makes sense all right yeah so that context my story is called a journey in the dense woods elizabetha whirled around her flaxen hair cascading like a turbulent but soothing ocean over her shoulders. She could not believe Nigel could be so cold and blunt. He was always a stuffy old miser, but he had been particularly insufferable the last few weeks. Being the empath that she was, she knew he was either jealous or his wife had moved out of the manor again, or perhaps a touch of both. Pardon me, my lord, she asked coldly and bluntly. You heard me very well, Miss Humpersham, he shot back, coolly and undiplomatically. I promise you that nothing good will come of you gallivanting around with that unrefined oaf. He may be of noble blood, but he has the wildness of a common sailor. Do you forbid me to see him, my lord? She addressed her question with a frigid terseness. His response was as icy as it was frank. I knew it would make no difference if I tried, he said candidly and utterly devoid of warmth. She was halfway down the stairs by the time he finished the sentence. She barely slowed down when Rothbard attempted to question her on her way out the portcullis. Don't wait up for me, my lord. I have much to attend to. And then there's the little, like, asterisks that are sort of a bit of an act break. So for the, it's, it's one of the, can I interrupt? Is this, can I ask a question? Sure. Yeah, I guess so. What is one of the things that you noticed when you were reading your erotica that there tends to be two adjectives for no fucking reason? Like <laughs> after every verb? Uh, I just sort of, I, I noticed that a lot of the conversations are very self-serious and um, I also started writing this like an hour before we started so i just started going for i did a lot of googling for adjectives for you know cold and blunt so cold and blunt came up a few times yeah okay yeah uh while we're interrupted is your is your you're on that same microphone right yeah is it like is your dial cranked way up on it uh, the uh the gain dial? gain How's yeah, because I'm I'm hearing like every dog movement. I would turn it down if you can. I just did. Is that okay. still? That's probably better. Okay. It was nary an hour later when she found herself in Chanceworth's embrace at the seaside, but it had felt like a day's journey. The ocean breeze ruffled her hair like the drapes she used to peer through, pining for him as she watched him stroll through the courtyard from afar. She was so shy then, but she still was, and even though it wasn't the first time he'd held her like this, that was 400 pages ago. Each of the countless times he'd wrapped his strong arms around her at this persistently windy outcropping in the intervening chapters, it felt brand new again. Still, even this time, it truly felt different. 
we've denied ourselves so long, he whispered throatily in her ear, her now unleashed hair tumbling across his coarse beard. Surely you can feel how thoroughly I yearn for you. It was true. Through her thin dress, she could feel every part of him pressed against her, with a very particular protrusion straining his breeches. She had yet to see it, but she could envision it from what she could glean by touch and longed to stroke it. A deep mahogany mat of tightly wound curls, <laughs> manicured but still masculine. She sighed deeply, leaning back into him, giving him his cue to wander his hands down her slender body to their ultimate goal. Softly but firmly, his fingers massaged their way into the fine thatch of maple that formed a feminine triangle just below her waist. <laughs> It felt like a lifetime ago that a man had been down there, so long ago that the one she'd been with was nearly a boy with his unkempt walnut hedge fumbling awkwardly against her unruly birchen bush. <laughs> Why? <laughs> Why the trees? <laughs> Do you desire this? He asked, shattering her daydream. Her ha his hands were edging their way to remove her vestments. Yes, my lord, she responded breathily. Yes, most indeed. It all happened in a blur of fabric and flesh and swishing locks most private. Finally, after so many near <laughs> encounters, after so many longing gazes, after so many inscrutable side plots, she had him where she needed him most, his masculine tangle straining her at her awaiting rug, both <laughs> manes glistening now with anticipatory sweat. Wait, for the record, do they have genitals or is this just all pubes? <laughs> Oh, they got genitals. It's just, you know, you focus on the most erotic parts, which is the pubes. <laughs> right, 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 right. Cool. Silly me. Go on. Without so much as foreplay, his now inelastic and ungiving erogenous member was inside her, but she hardly noticed. What resonated through her most strongly was the fateful intertwining of their respective intimate tresses playing at each other, <laughs> first gently kissing freshly shorn tips, then their very follicles becoming almost as one. The dance of his musky male fur against her dainty, sensuous fleece brought profound ecstasy welling within them both. This went on for a blissful eternity, encapsulated concisely in a tidy six paragraphs, culminating in an obligatory climax at the exact same moment. As she thrashed, he withdrew his ever-rigid scepter and spilled his carnal juices onto her most precious wool, <laughs> his thick chest heaving. As he collapsed beside her, she rolled over and clutched her soft hand into his sated woolen forest. He laughed softly, but in a way that was still conventionally manly. <laughs> Do you care to rest there a while, my love? She smiled demurely. I'm never letting go, my lord. The end. Oh, God. <sighs> that was... That was incredible. Nice. I object to the term throatily. <laughs> I love that that's what you object to above all else in that. No, the rest was great. No notes. <laughs> I mean, that's also a thing. Like, it that was a big part of the, the Charles and Camilla erotica, but I found another, like, throaty laugh in a romantic scene in one of these books. So I was like, I, I guess you got to have that. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. Everyone wants a phlegmy lover. <laughs> mine's gonna be a little more r-rated uh yours left a lot to the imagination mine's going to well that's because not... mine is romance yours is erotica is it mine's you know, mine's well not gonna leave anything to the imagination so uh Hell we'll yeah. start here we're gonna start uh in the midst of the act i stood her up and let her grab onto the back side of the sofa at long last i would look at her everything i unzipped the remainder of her dress and pulled down her panties her p***ed up faced me in anticipation. A stream of her d leaked down from her happy h letting me know she was ready and waiting for action. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, boy. I grabbed her left leg and raised it up, holding her sideways. Her p raised to the world. I locked myself in. <sighs> You're finally inside me surrounded me as I became one with her. I slowly pulled out, giving a nice before going into full dive. Her d had already coated my d like white d She was definitely down there. This woman was without question already in full meltdown. 
Better get her off nice and good before she got impatient. I, r I wrapped my hand around her leg and thrusted myself in and out. Once again, my vision narrowed until all I could see was the sugary <laughs> from her as my vanished in and out of her. So this was her. This was her in where not even she could see. My slapped against her clapping me vigorously on as she gave me her private performance. Yes, this was her most secret performance. For only me. An applause intensified. Her swayed and her moans filled the apartment. I shoved myself in deep, but her took everything I had and more. As expected. And more? And more? What's the, don't want to know. What's the more? What's the more? As expected of a lady, her was beyond what I could. She looked back at me, her glassy with. I think I'm, I think I'm. Her clamped down on me as the fine lady first. She covered fine her face lady. and she as devastated her nerves. Oh no. But this wasn't the end Devastated of it. Devastated, even. I intensified my <laughs> f power and tore through her clenched. <laughs> my other hand traveled up her body, admiring every curve until we were arriving at the glorious <laughs> of her. She remained upright as I sideways, unquestionably a position that only <laughs> could pull off. This was too much. She was so now. Poor was giving it his all. Update status to condition red. Imminent. In a minute. Energy spiked through my body, <laughs> causing my hand to clamp down onto her boob, nearly vanishing within. The entire length of my slid in and out. At this rate, her were pouring out like a body of her convulsed in and out as her muscles spav spasm. <laughs> was this woman still? Ah, <sighs> girls really got to hog all the fun. Jesus but I, Christ. I was at my limit. All the pipes in my system cracked and steamed as the <laughs> drained from my body and jammed up in my chowder buster. <laughs> <laughs> it's too late to abort now. Everything was firing away. <laughs> With one last rush into Nemu's <laughs> I hosed in my <laughs> finger to the brim with Jesus Christ. <laughs> Her closed up as my <laughs> was <laughs> the mass of opposing forces of her <laughs> and my <laughs> met, causing my universe to tear open. <laughs> was backing up. The mighty force. Oh, <laughs> finally, my <laughs> muscles her <laughs> apart and <laughs> its second, even mightier <laughs> into her. <laughs> the <laughs> white <laughs> mixed with her <laughs> a lovely concoction of our own making. Good fucking god! <laughs> so, so what? What inspired that? Let's let's talk through this. Let's, let's... For the record, our fans are loving it. I, I can I can see that. I I think it's so funny. Um, in in like erotica, because like the different uh different words for the uh male sex organ, and to me, like is the much more like sexually infused one whereas like just sounds really funny so to hear it in like erotica is just really it just makes it even better it's like oh what? yeah my I'm, I'm a big fan of the chowder buster to be honest chowder buster was good <laughs> my most and least favorite part of that was how like you you had all these euphemisms and then all of a sudden you just said boob <laughs> yeah boob was like a it was an outlier as, there yeah, as yeah. has um, been <laughs> as has been pointed out by one of our previous guests you you can't say boob like it's just yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh god uh what inspired that is there is a particular genre of video game called the visual novel and there has not been a single one that has an erotic sex scene that hasn't been the most hilarious thing to read in my entire life. They're all bad. Every one of them. And uh, I just wanted to capture the spirit of that in that reading. You know, I think what really what really changes the vibe is, but you know, between our readings is like, I wrote mine ironically, but I could tell yours was extremely sincere. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> that's what you have to go with. That's what makes it worse is sincerity. If you write that without a trace of irony, it gets so much better. Yeah, thank you for that. Uh, um, also, I know, right? <laughs> you hear that a lot, actually. Or like, do you? The the is a big one you'll hear as well. I yeah, I've read a couple of things where I'm like, mm, really? You think yeah. you're going into the? I don't. Yeah, that's the, those are the big ones. So you always have to include something like that, like, oh, you're my or something like that. <laughs> we don't kink shame here, but. So mine, I think it's my turn. Um, it is. Mine, I think, is significantly shorter um, than than those, but also but but written with love. I wrote it. I think it took I, I think I was able to do this in about 15 minutes. Uh, which leads me to think that, like, every time I want to get writing done, I need to have someone give me, like, a time deadline that I have to read it on a stream. Because I wrote, like, 500 words in, like, 15 minutes, which is, like, that's great. Uh, I, I would love to be able to write that much all the time. Um, <laughs> I don't think I have a title, but maybe maybe this is one of those stories where after we read the story, we can we can craft an appropriate title. <clears throat> There's also no humans in this story. Um, oh, interesting. So change of pace here. Um, well, you're bringing it back to the roots. If, if this is like ogres and goblins again. Uh, not that so much. Um, no. We'll see. Goblin these nuts. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. All right. It was a rough night out on the lake, like so many nights before. The kind of night that almost makes a ship crave the touch of another vessel. <laughs> Howling wind, crashing waves, and thick, blanketing fog made for a navigational nightmare. Still, the valiant three-masted schooner fought her way forward. Suddenly, an imposing shape loomed menacingly, a hulking mass in the low light of the foggy midnight sea. It was... Could it be? It was. A freighter. A big one from the looks of it. Long and sleek, yes. But with an admirable girth that would make most vessels on the lakes envious. <laughs> the schooner had little time to gawk, however, as the freighter was barreling down right upon her, roughly amidships, Seemingly hell-bent on splitting her asunder. <laughs> the schooner tried desperately to come about, hoping to avoid the worst. Hoping to avoid the worst with such a sizable beast of a vessel. But to no avail. The impact was fierce, and the freighter's bow plunged into the schooner's flank, slicing into her wooden structure like a penis through butter. <laughs> <laughs> the schooner knew it, should have felt wrong. She knew she shouldn't be getting herself into situations like this, certainly not with a big, bulging brute of a freighter like this one. No, her builders would never have approved of this. The freighter must have seen her in the fog first, and had pulled back hard on its engines in the hope of stopping entirely. Owing to these mighty efforts, the weight of the collision wasn't all that it could have been, but still far more than the schooner could take. Deeper. Deeper. The freighter's bow sliced, plunging well beyond what the schooner had ever imagined possible. No one. Nothing had ever been this deep inside of her, not even that summer when she spent several months getting dry docked in Sandusky. <laughs> the freighter's engines finally came into reverse, fighting heroically to pull the bow free to little effect. It was a tight fit, and the schooner wasn't giving up so easily. The waves did their work, too, smashing against the vessels in their harsh yet sensual embrace. Back and forth they rocked, small progress being made in the extrication, only for the bulky ore carrier to be forced back into the schooner's gaping starboard cavity. Pushing, twisting, grinding, thrusting in the waves, the two ships danced until yet another impact was felt on the schooner, this one 
from her stern. The rocks! She'd been pushed onto the deadly dagger-like submarine ridge at the mouth of the bay. <laughs> With the schooner now caught from behind, the, oh, freighter no. managed, the freighter managed to finally pull out, fully spent. Gathering its energy, it turned and set engines to full ahead. The schooner gazed longingly at her paramour. As it sailed off into the mist-draped horizon, never even managing to make out the gold letters of the stranger's name across the stern. The schooner had never felt so full, physically or emotionally. Though mostly physically, as her hold was now rapidly filling with water, and the full fury of the lake began to tear her apart. A loud crack was heard, and a mighty canyon appeared to open between her third and fourth cargo hatches. It was the end for the humble little boat, but oh... What an end it had been. She went beneath the waves, first her bow and then her stern. She drifted down, down into the cold, murky depths, split open, sunk, but supremely satisfied. <laughs> <laughs> I am disappointed that you didn't make a single joke about how wet she was. <laughs> that's, that's, that's Bush League. Uh, well, no, what I Kelly's story was Bush League. What I what I realized what I realized is that like if you just use all the same words that shipwrecks are written about anyway, it basically is erotica because it's all very penetrative and like a lot of talks about things like things like gaping open and being split. Like it's like oh, this is this this could easily be like morphed into an erotica. So. Well, call me the Gales of November the way I come early with that story. <laughs> you know, it's o it's okay if you finish a little schooner. <laughs> I I did. Did anyone have an experience of like, uh, being a young person and reading a Cosmo and trying to parse out like whether their sex tips were insane or not? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. One hundred percent. I don't think one, I ever did that. This one that I remember, I was in like junior high, and it was like a bunch of us, like they, they, these girls had a Cosmo, and we were all like reading it together. And this one was like, they say every seventh wave in the ocean is the strongest. So make I every read that exact same tip. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. So make every seventh thrust the strongest. And uh, I, I'm just trying to imagine doing that where you're like counting to seven constantly. Like One, two, as. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's just like imagine like someone is thrusting into you and they're just whispering quietly into their ear like. Wah! Like just it's like, <laughs> it's like it's like counting out like a very odd time signature, um, like in music. But yeah, someone's trying to do prog rock in your <laughs> yeah. hole. And like <laughs> that's very that's weird. Much. That's hilarious. Do you think that they like repeat that tip like it's in like different like intervals, or do you think we just have the exact same copy of Cosmo? I mean, we're no wait. I was gonna say you're slightly younger than me. I mean, this would have I was in junior high, so this would have been like. I don't know. I don't want to work backwards on this. I bet you I bet you they copy paste a lot. Honestly, like you got to put out a it. meaningless magazine every month. Like you're going to be just regurgitating. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Meaningless. Yeah, yep. it is. It's bad. Oh. I remember I can't remember even remember what it was, but I remember I uh, like a few years later I had a boyfriend and I was like, I read a magazine once that told me to do this thing. And he was like, don't ever do that. Don't ever do that to anybody. Why would they say that? <laughs> yeah, I, I would say like, especially the the ones involving like do this to a penis. A lot of them were exceptionally hellish. <laughs> uh. It's uh, yeah, I remember. When uh, we were, yeah, when we were still pretty young, I guess, like, yeah, probably high school or something like that. Braun and I got a Cosmo. We're like flipping through this, like, we got to figure out, like, what the secrets are here. And looking through them all, we're just like, what the fuck is this shit? <laughs> what is going on? 
I one thing that stuck with me in a Cosmo once was it was like it was like tips for not making the guy that you've just hooked up with run away. <laughs> And I specifically, it's like burned into my memory. They referred to like leaving your underwear out on the floor. It was like, oh, make sure not to leave them out sunny side up. (laughs) (laughs) Why would you do that to me? That was like 17 years ago. And I cannot forget that ever. That is burned into me forever. Sunny side up. So that's, that's incredible. That's an amazing term. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it oh, ruined I'm my life. On. Yeah, I'm holding on to that one forever, Nicole. <laughs> Great, good. Never I say never, that to a woman. <laughs> I never I never read through a Cosmo. All of my sex education came from in fifth grade, we took a field trip to a place called the Robert Crown Center outside of Chicago. And so we had it was a sex education field trip. Um the whole day. We were just sitting in like a big assembly and they would have people telling us some of it was like diagrams and stuff. And some of it was like, hey, you do this and it's going to feel like this. And it's very weird thinking about it now, because like, how old are you in fifth grade? Like 10? 10? Yeah. Yeah, it was weird to spend a whole day uh, doing that um, on a field trip. Normally, field trips are fun. You know, the zoo, a movie, ice skating, something like that. But that one was not. (laughs) We had something similar in eighth grade, though, did we not, Nicole? Cool, cool camp? camp? Yeah. Yeah. What's yeah, it called? That, cool cool camp. camp. Cool camp? Yeah. yeah. You learn about how not to do drugs or have sex ever. Yeah. Oh, so it's like a, like a combination of dare and sex ed. Yeah. Yeah. yeah sure there was. You never do anything like that. Yeah. Is, dare, oh, go ahead. is dare also in Canada? Yeah. 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 yeah absolutely. Yeah. Cool. We didn't do dare, though. I don't remember doing dare in our class, but we had cool know, camp. I so why do you need dare for it? Yeah, exactly. Did you say you didn't? Da- you wouldn't dare, <laughs> Kelly. No, I was being normal. We definitely did dare, and we had some cop car to come to our school, and he was like, "You know, I'm. Uh, I don't know why this stuck with me, but like a lot of dare is the dumbest shit imaginable. Where they are like, if you smoke weed, you will die of an overdose, and you're like, okay, sure, um." But I remember we did this exercise that was so meaningless. It was just, I think it was like a self-esteem exercise where, and again, this is a time that we could have been learning, like, I don't know how to do our taxes or something useful. But so we were given like a blank license plate and it was like, come up with your own vanity plate. And it wasn't even a thematically come up with an anti-drug vanity plate it was like just tell us about who you are and he was like i see it's like but do it in seven letters and his was like i put good guy because i think i'm a good guy and i was just like this is not even teaching me about drugs like <laughs> i, I don't to understand the point. So that you can- we had a little like workbook that we'd have like dare homework for and i would always forget to do it because it wasn't a real subject I'm like it. <laughs> and i had like social studies and math homework to do um and so i'd always forget to do it and i think we had it every friday and that was the first class that i learned i could just not do because i wasn't getting a real grade for it and there was nothing that they could do about it so that was my first act of academic rebellion as a child i guess was in dare class um not like doing drugs and smoking but just not doing the homework that was still way cooler than going to the libertarian meeting. So you kind of yeah. actually trended <laughs> downward. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a trend that has continued. So and speaking of trending downwards, wait, unless unless you feel inspired, Nicole, and you have a piece of erotica you want to just improvise, but uh no. I was I was get, like I thought that maybe there would be something in here because I do want to point out the notebook also says hard work on it. I believe it says <laughs> dra uh crow. Oh, yeah, sorry. That makes sense. Um, I was reading it backwards. Yeah. Um, but then I open it up. I mean, maybe I could read this in a sexy voice and maybe it will turn you guys on. Let's find out. De-stressed zone impending the propagation of large EQ. Thoughts on EQ control relies on not making or in the first place I don't know what that means. Babe, do you want to read this? Do you think you can do a better job? (laughs) (laughs) 
there's uh, some earthquake erotica for you. No, oh, well, that's that's that I'm seems that seems there. inappropriate at, t- at a time like this. Oh, there is that. Yeah, I could have written a really inappropriate one. <laughs> <laughs> and now that we're all all bunched up and ready to just burst forward, we can start our game. Bursting with chowder. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> Oh, I'm spilling wine on myself. That was such a bad idea. <laughs> Give me a second. So, Nicole, I have a question. Yeah. Which which was worse? Uh, the, the analogy of the white f- or the sugary f- uh, which which would you say is worse in that situation? I, I think it I'm gonna on go the with the uh, on the on the cum text. What? <laughs> these, this, <laughs> these both had nothing to do with cum. This was this this was her. F- no, I know. I can't remember the context because there was one where you said a. S- of. Yeah, that and was the. Whatever that one was disturbed me the most. That's that's the 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 one the syrup mm, one mm, for cool. me. Yeah, hated for it. me it was the it was the. F- because today at work we were talking about the trend from like early 2000s of like boys with their like tips in their hair (laughs) and so all i was thinking of this is just being like all in this person's hair so that that made it the worst for me that's fair that's fair i was just curious because like yeah i saw your face sort of contort and revulsion a few times during that (laughs) yeah yeah it was all bad if that's what you're asking ah good good that's what i'm aiming for Really hard to isolate a single thing that really jumped out. It was more of the collective experience. <laughs> Look at this good boy just guarding yeah. me. Just, just tr- keeping you, keeping you safe. Hey, Rocky boy. He's deaf. He's deaf as fuck. <laughs> he can't hear me. Oh, Ryan too. <laughs> I realized that one of our cats, um, like how with a kid you might say like their first name and then like their full name if they're in trouble. Yeah. And I realized that one of our cats responds to the same thing. She was trying to eat. Uh, so our, our youngest cat is is uh, Josie. And um, she was trying to eat Winston's food. And so I said, Josie. And she like looked at me over her shoulder and like went back to eating his food. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, Josephine. And she like got up and she went over to her food bowl. I was like, yes. Her <laughs> full name works. Full name works. Mm-hmm. <sighs> well, Unlike our erotic stories, this uh, this story still features a lot of blood, so we'll get back into it. Uh, <laughs> I mean, that was the next scene in mine, but... <laughs> Nicole, your faces just make it all worth it. <laughs> Good. I'm glad I can help. <laughs> <laughs> so, when we last left our intrepid heroes, they had fallen into a pit that had opened up uh, near the island that they had found themselves on where there was a cultist hideout. There's some certain Lovecraftian elements starting up there. Now, as they were falling, we sort of cut to black on that. So before we get started, we're going to introduce our characters again. Kelly, we'll start with you. Yeah, so uh, my name is Pego, and Pego is a robot. And... Uh, just for clarification, because this has come up before, I feel like since Pego is entirely made of uh, manufactured parts and has absolutely no reason to have any kind of gender, Pego does use they, them pronouns. <laughs> so all we're, right. all, we're well, all working well, on yeah, it. Yeah, well, look, we're, we're getting better. We're getting better. Yeah. We're, we're working on become allies to our, our robot friends. And I mean... You know, I'll recap this stuff that's not on the character sheet. Pego is a pegging robot. Um, Pego is sort of a large box that moves around on treads, but has a giant sort of like hatch on the front that does kind of everything from like sampling to healing to pleasuring. And also, uh, and it has like a sort of a protruding R2-D2 arm that's more for sampling, less for pleasuring, because we actually haven't seen the pegging arm yet. Nobody has been pegged yet. 
surprisingly in the like two hours of uh pegging <laughs> robot storytelling we've done but you know here's hoping for this incarnation all right and now nicole your turn um i also don't have my character sheet oh my goodness. why don't we use this i was gonna make this after introduction but why don't we just take a break to run to the washroom grab our sheets etc cetera, etc cetera. why don't we wonderful call that an intermission? idea because i have to piss so bad <laughs> intermission Okay, yeah, so you're you're on a different it might just be the fact that you're in a giant cavernous room, but like like even your like keyboard noises are pounding in my ears, so I'm curious what is like different with the setup, but it's just it's so uh, hard to like guess at remotely. Oh god. Is that better? I think it's a lot better. Yeah, no kidding. I turned my game the wrong way, so when I said I was... Oh, you turned it up when you said you turned it down. <laughs> fucking character. <laughs> I turned it up to 11. <laughs> All right. I, I truly have no words. <laughs> oh, that's a first. Uh, hmm, okay. Well, at least, at least I know I'm not crazy, because I was like, okay, I know that I bug Nicole every single day, every single week about this, but like, this is literally a step backward from what it was before. Something has changed. Did you di diagnose the, the microphone? Yeah. Yeah, the answer is Nicole doesn't know how to turn up for a turn down game. I... You know why? Because her video feed is mirrored, so her knob is backwards. <laughs> well, I was kind of looking around like this, and so I was like, okay, well, this will be the down. No, I'm an idiot. Yeah, I guess I can start. My uh, character's name is Helm McKeelstern. I'm uh, old and grizzled. I'm missing an eye and have a pig leg. Um, I no one has any memory of where I came from or when I boarded the ship. Um, I like to pretend that I've been sailing for a long time, but as soon as people ask me any sort of questions or need my expertise, it quickly becomes very apparent that that is not true. Um, Am I a uh, opportunist, a grifter? Am I trying to cover up a bout of amnesia? Who's to say? Um, I've also very recently in the last episode developed uh, some sort of fetish, a very specific fetish for sticking my appendages into holes. Um, just any hole, not not like a not a sec not a sexual hole, not an inherently sexual hole, just like anything. Well, and any appendage too, right? Any appendage, yes. Started with started out with my leg, and uh, yeah, As now here we are. We developed from there. That's that's, that's the game. Always where it starts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have a unique talent where I am able to plug my nose. I have not used this yet. Plug my nose and build up enough pressure in my head to shoot my glass eye out like a cannonball. Uh, science can't explain it. That's yep. No, that's fair. That's fair. Um, my inventory item. I have a crutch, but I uh, don't have a leg anymore, so I can't really let go of my crutch because I will fall right over. And finally, Tanner, who is your character? All right, I am Wellbeck Willie. Uh, Wellbeck Willie is a veteran sea captain uh, in in both uh, naval and civilian capacities, and he he wears the marks of that on his uniform in an, an incoherent mix of nations and services. Um, just a just a lot of stuff, a lot of chest candy uh, for Wellbeck Willie. Um, uh, sailing days ended with quote the incident um something that wellback willie never expands on what exactly it was but gestures vaguely with his uh uh instead of a hook he has tongs uh on his on his uh in place of a hand whenever he refers to the incident um what else here inventory wise i've got a purple velvet tricorn hat that hasn't really played much of a role in the story, uh, and a rusted cutlass with a large fake ruby in the hilt. Um, can communicate fluently with elephant seals, provided that we're using the same uh, dialect. It's not a, it's not a wide familiarity, but but as long as we we share that, we can we can talk. As the three of you fall down the long and gaping chasm, <laughs> you feel. No. Problem, Sorry, Nicole? can you describe this chasm in a little more detail? Like, what is the humidity of this chasm? 
I would describe it as moist. <laughs> I would describe it as maybe musty. Mm-hmm. Um, Are, is there is there moisty. any kind of foliage growing just over this <laughs> chasm? And can you describe that foliage? <laughs> well, you see, there was there was there was a rock island in the area at the tip. We could call that the metaphorical uh, the clitoris, if we will. <laughs> would you describe the foliage as thatched? <laughs> Uh, I, I can't tell you what kind of trees are on there, whether it's maple or walnut or birch <laughs> or mahogany or mahogany, but I'm sure there's some on there before you land and splat yourselves all over the, the ground. You see fast approaching a gust of warm wind kicks up in the chasm, slowing you down. Are we, are we splatching on the ground just in front of each other? Or did we go to like, <laughs> like secluded corners to do this? <laughs> I won't have any of this. I won't have my very serious story, very serious, Kelly, undermined by your japes and jesters. Well, you told me you weren't sure you had an hour of content, and I promised <laughs> you we would extend the timeline with it. So. Uh, but instead, you just land with a soft thump on a pulsing and Would you say a soft yet gentle, or a firm yet gentle thump? <laughs> yes, a firm yet gentle coercing you if you will mm. uh that uh, the the mass you land on appears to be flesh hell yeah and it pulsates and vibrates like an active hell organ yeah beating the life essence of a struggling being <laughs> good lord <laughs> the open chasm of space <laughs> i appear to have landed on a fleshy area and i have splashed please allow five to ten minutes until i am prepared to operate again <laughs> so is uh uh pego has a uh, he has the ability to 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 sample uh like dna and stuff right with your with your arm you affirmative just, you could just jam it down and sorry the, who the has who has the ability to sample it <laughs> they have the ability oh yeah yes yes pego. pego has did I did I did I say he? I thought I was I was oh, talking to him in the sure second did. person. Um, <laughs> talking to who in the second person? So Pego, you <laughs> can you sample uh, to see what kind of being we're dealing with here? Can you drill right down in there? And I forgive you for your missteps and using pronouns. I understand you have been playing a lot of Hogwarts Legacy lately. <laughs> Sorry, what was your question? I wasn't really paying attention. I want, I want you to jam your stick down into the flesh and see what it is. How do we make this happen? What do I have to roll? On it. And I jam. Now I will remind that this is not like my R two D two arm is not the appendage that I peg with. Uh, <laughs> anyway, so I jam the very like sharp angular R two D two arm into the soil to sample it. The soil, you say? Well, into okay, into the surface that we are standing on. Yes. All right. I need you to roll a strength, Kelly. Oh, do, oh, what the fuck? Are you kidding me? Have I ever mentioned to any of you that I hate technology? I hate it more than anything else in the goddamn world. I was curious that you chose to be a robot for this adventure, considering. I, because we live in an imagined future where the pegging robot just fucking works. It works as intended, <laughs> and there's no fucking bullshit. You turn the pegging robot on, and it fucking pegs you. That's how technology works, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, yes. God, I spent... Like, it took me 40 minutes to write an absolute fucking Nobel Prize worthy piece of erotica. And it took me like two hours to get this stupid audio video set up right. And then it still died. Well, you better roll your strength roll. You watch me roll my strength roll, you fuck. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I am normal at strength. Here we go. All right. So five. So if you remember correctly, Pego, uh, you had damaged your uh, your arm last uh, last session. Oh, fuck. 
And thus, it, you don't have enough power to penetrate the fleshy insides of whatever you're standing upon. So instead, the flesh just gives for a while and then springs back. And the entire cavern shakes as if trying to... Like a cow shakes off flies, just a shudder, basically. Sure. So that's what happened with my R2-D2 arm. But since I keep mentioning it, I would like to try and kind of gently massage my pegging appendage into it. Okay. Uh, let's see here. What do we get rolling for that? I, was say, I guess if this if this persuasion? doesn't if this doesn't work, <laughs> I have I have another option that we can use if the pegging is unsuccessful. Reroll sensuality. Who made this character sheet that doesn't have sensuality as a stat? That's my question. I know, right? Right. Uh, let's see. Let's let's just uh, we'll give you a. Give you a bonus to another st- strength roll here. We'll give you a strength roll plus two here. Bonus to strength. Is this how you gently massage things, Josh? Yes, yes. You got to get it I nice think, and deep. I think this is more of an intelligence uh, roll. You got to know how to so do it. so many things. It could be agility. It could it be could agility. Be gently wisdom. massaging. You know, they say that wisdom is the most erogenous stat. Say that strength of getting that nice deep massage in is what you need to do for. This creature is a sapiosexual, so the wisdom is, is going to be the key to get in there. <laughs> okay, well, I will defer to the GM because I would never try to argue in rules lawyer a GM. So what am I rolling? You're rolling strength. With the plus two bonus. This fucking bullshit! Oh! I got a two. <laughs> oh! Now I take the better of the two rolls, right? So, that's a flat-out botch, and I don't think we've actually had one of those in these games so far. Only in the jamming. So, if that didn't work, I want to use my cutlass to cut out a little sample, and I can just give it to Pego to test. Well, before you do that, we have to deal with the consequences of the botch here, because it's not often that we get snake eyes. (laughs) So, Pego, as you attempt to gently massage your pegging appendage, you lose grip on your treads and plummet face, what would be face first onto the ground, onto the fleshy ground, and you feel your pegging appendage bend. Oh. Well, by pegging no- appendage. Then. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, no. You can no longer put it back into its storage compartment. It is now so, out. I, as I attempt to, oh wait, I don't, I think we've established that I can't write myself. Yeah, I know you're stuck Error. right now. <laughs> Please assist me in returning to my upright position. <laughs> um, that's actually called a penile prolapse for the record. Oh, well, there you go. Well, I was, I was going to I was going to ask if, if robots can suffer from Peroni's disease. <laughs> I guess they can. So. What is Peroni's disease? That's the that's the official name for having a bent penis. Oh, I know this not if from this personal experience, but then consider me. But I lapse. <laughs> but there are there are TV commercials that come on sometimes for some. It's like ask your doctor about this medicine. I guess it unbends your penis. I don't know what it does. Um, but ask your you do have insane an TV commercials in the US that you heat up on your stove. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah, that'd be like Looney Tunes style if they had to deal yeah. with it. They would... <laughs> like, it's not a, not a theme that they cover. But you know. <laughs> anytime I feel like this mostly happens if I'm like pirate streaming hockey. But if I watch an American feed, it's like just 15 commercials of like, if you have been seriously injured by this untested pharmaceutical, Mm -hmm. call this personal injury lawyer. It's just every commercial on TV is what props (laughs) in your economy. Yeah. Oh, I love it. Absolutely love it. So uh, are you guys going to help old, uh, old Pego out there? Yeah. Yeah. We just, we just have to lift him up. Yeah. You just got to help him up. Lift who up? Them. Lift them up. up. (laughs) We're going to lift them up. All right. I'm not going to get a check on that. You just, you upright okay. Pego, and then you see that their pegging appendage is bent. So I, well, did, do they see that? Because I feel like the first thing I would do when I flip up is attempt to like rotate. You know, it's like if you're uh, a, a, maybe an adolescent who has wet themselves or had an unforeseen 
bodily function. You just you want to face the wall and be like, oh, nothing's happening. You could curl Sucks. up like a pill bug. <laughs> If you I'm want still to pretty boxy. It. I don't well, think I could curl up like a pill bug, but I just kind of want to like rotate away before <laughs> they can see my bent appendage. Then that's fine. Yeah, yeah. You do that. You look away. Oh, I do it successfully. I yeah, 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 yeah. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you sure? I also ne never mind. Wow, I sure love looking at this horizon. Uh, thank you for helping me up. I am going to look in the other direction for a minute. And I think I want to attempt to retract my pegging appendage, like <laughs> into its port. All yeah. Well, roll me an agility, Kelly. Let's 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 <laughs> let's, let's roll an agility on this. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll I'll take that. There's no way I can get three bad normal rolls in a row, right? You think that, but I've played a lot of tabletop. Hmm. Five. Yeah, that's not too. that's yeah, that's not adequate enough to uh, get the appendage back into into its port. It just sort of glances against it and doesn't doesn't retract properly. Is there anything around me? Like, are there maybe any I don't know blankets laying around? There's no blankets here, just chasms of flesh in all directions. So I guess I have to think about, I have to hedge my bets in terms of who I want to, who I'm most concerned about being embarrassed in front of. And uh, I think it was, I think it was Helm McKeelstern that I was starting to have a connection with, right? Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to turn to uh, Whaleback Willie. Admiral Captain Willie, would you come confer here for a moment? We need to talk about uh, Ensign McKeelstern's surprise birthday party. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh. And I like kind of blush and turn away. <laughs> yeah, okay. so I, I pull Whaleback Willie aside and I'm like, uh, Admiral Captain Willie, I must confess that I appear to have caused damage to a very important appendage. Do you have some sort of garment that I may cover myself with until such time as we can reach a maintenance department? Um, I I will take off my my highly decorated jacket and I can give that to to <laughs> Pego to cover his shame. Their Thank shame. You. <laughs> Their shame. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay. so i mean i guess i'm just gonna cover my shame <laughs> and uh, in this jacket and or just... or maybe i could just take off one of my little ribbon medals and and you could drape it i was gonna say <laughs> what about your tricorn hat <laughs> no that that's that's mine that's <laughs> that has to stay on at all times. is mine <laughs> the tricorn hat stays on during sex <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, am I am I covered? Uh, yeah, you are now covered. Yeah. So I try to play it cool. Wow. Now, I am so glad we had an impromptu exchanging of clothing, and you are now wearing my and my. I guess my eye things kind of probably move back and forth. <laughs> and oh man, do I have anything I can? I don't think I could pull off having clothing. I guess I owe you, and I owe you on. Clothing. I promise I have a very cool wardrobe in the ship hold. <laughs> Think nothing of it. Happy to help. <laughs> it's not the first time I've seen someone's appendage. Uh, I don't damaged. know what you are talking about. <laughs> my appendage is in excellent condition. <laughs> Uh, we, you know, we have been planning birthdays for a long time. Perhaps we should ask Ensign McGillstern what to do next. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I don't know what this thing be that we be standing on. Oh, thank you, my love. Oh, okay. Gross. <laughs> I just got an ice cream delivery. I say, yeah, <laughs> I... I don't know what we'd be standing on, but it seems to be made of flesh and probably alive. 
Um, so I am going, I would like to try to use my special ability to pierce it with me eye. All right. So just a sec here. This could backfire so hilariously. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Literally. You're doing your special talent, which means you get a plus Sorry, two. I really roll. hate to interrupt, but like, is it possible, Nicole? Just a small note. Can you crinkle that wrapper like a little closer to directly in front of the? Yeah, that's perfect. Oh, that's peaking. That's peaking bad. <laughs> Nicole, Can please you fully, stop. <laughs> fully envelop the microphone. Oh no! Don't do that. In the wrapper, yeah. Just just put it on like a. Oh, gross! Should yeah, have had that with please. ASMR going on while we were reading our. Uh... Like, erotica instead instead of the foam <laughs> we could use we could use wrapper instead. oh god yeah let's see anything that blocks sound it's all the same <laughs> uh since uh since you're using your unique talent you'll get a plus two to your roll here and uh let's get you to roll mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i don't want to keep using strength the dice so, sound too good. Can you just roll the wrapper somehow? Yeah, I can totally just, do that. Just roll the wrapper onto some sort of flat surface and they write a bunch of numbers on it. And let's uh, let's say let's say uh, roll your speed. Um, how am I for speed? Mm -hmm. Um. Oh, I am bad at it. You're bad at yeah, it. Yeah, I noticed in the last 30 seconds how bad you are at speed. <laughs> okay. So I got a nine, and I got a six. All right, so we have to take the lower of the two because you're bad, and uh, plus two, so that's still an eight. So puffing your cheeks out and taking a big breath, you fire that eyeball, and it strikes into the ground bursts the sight of impact and bounces back nicely into your hand. Lovely. Yep. As you're doing that, a gush of clear fluid erupts from the hole that your oh, eye... Did you say it's a sticky... Is it, is it so sugary... <laughs> like white... Came <laughs> out. It's <laughs> out stringily. Spume. <laughs> Why stringily? <laughs> Stings down her inner thighs. It's it's so weird how we have such poor audience retention. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> Anyways, uh, so yeah, there's now uh, what here's like a deafening roar echoes throughout the caverns as the clear fluid erupts from the ground. Clear fluid, not red. Yep, clear fluid. Okay. <laughs> you doing okay over there, Kelly? I'm doing great. <laughs> um, can, can I taste the fluid? <laughs> you sure can. You sure can. Do that's, I need a roll, a or, roll or can I just... Yeah, that's absolutely... Because, yeah, I want to try to diagnose what this might be. There's a lot of clear fluids in the world. It could be water. It could be Sprite. It could be any number of things between. Um, so I, I just want to taste this and see. So I'm good at perception. So yep. does that mean I roll four and take the highest two? Is that... Yeah, yeah. Well, no, 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 no. You oh, gotta have distinct okay. pairs of dice. You take the highest pair. The highest pair. Yeah. Okay. Are there? Are there, is there a way to distinguish between the pairs that you have? Yes, I have two brown ones and two, uh, not brown. Creamy colored dice here. Uh, oh yeah, of course. So sweet. All right. Yeah. So like, if the brown pair is higher, take the brown, the right. higher pair. But if All you right. roll like a six brown and a six creamy syrup, like you don't take those twelve. Okay. Gotcha. Ooh, I got a four and a six. A four and a six. Okay, so you take the six. As you let some of the fluid puddle in your hands, you know that it's not entirely clear, but instead has a small yellowish tinge to it. You taste it and notice that it tastes like plasma. 
Hmm. I really hate to interrupt. Tanner, are you wearing your own podcast t shirt? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I am. Okay. That's free advertisement. That's I all I wanted to bring that up know. earlier. That's a sick shirt. <laughs> let's, let's move on. Uh, yeah. All right. So, yeah, uh, you, you taste plasma. Tastes a bit plasmatic to me. But not terrible. <laughs> There's worse tastes, I'm sure. I don't know. Okay. The, uh, the... I've tasted worse plasma. <laughs> I don't know. The hospital told me to stop breaking in, so... I can't do that anymore. Let's see. So we know this thing is alive and that it it more or less bleeds. Um, in in terms of like. I don't have a good spatial concept of where we are. Is there like is this like a cavern or is this more of like a tunnel? Is there like a place we could theoretically go? There's tunnels in all direction, but from all the blood coming out from the sides of the chasm that you fell into, you see it pooling into channels that go down one particular pathway. Let me recap here for a sec. So we like we went to some coordinates in our ship. Yes. They took us to sort of like the edge of this blood lake, which we ended up on a sort of island. Yeah. And then we stuck some appendages into a slot. Yeah which caused us to relocate to a chasm? What, 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 no. What's the gap I'm... So what you're missing, Kelly, what you're missing yeah. is that when you made the, uh, when you did the ritual on the altar there, it opened up a hole in the ocean that blood started right. draining oh, into. Oh, oh. Right. That, yeah. That was, our, that was our cliffhanger. Yeah. Okay. And so we... We were, and so we f- we finished the cliffhanger on the edge of the chasm. As you fell into it. As we fell into it. So yeah. we began our adventure at the bottom of this chasm. Yep. Uh, on a sort of shoreline of this rushing blood. Yes. And caused it to gush some delicious syrupy liquid. Yep. And now we are deciding whether we want to follow the obvious path of the raging river through this canyon. Yes. Right, because if we tried to go upstream, it would just be like, I mean, since this up. river is in a chasm, like upstream is just kind of where we started from, right? Yes, it's all pooling at the hole that you guys are in. So right intuitively, now. we should go downstream. That would be the idea. So because now my unique talents that do not need oxygen to breathe. So I think Pego is going to mention. Perhaps this is a good time to. Remind you that I can function briefly as a boat. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, I feel like I want to encourage. Um, I'm going to go. I was going to say face down, but I don't see the reason for that because I'm kind of just a big rectangular box. So I'm just going to kind of lay face up in the water and encourage <laughs> my. <laughs> Come there... with me if you want to float this river of blood. Um, just for aesthetic purposes, are there pieces or like panels of Pego that can like fold out to like make them more into the shape of a watercraft rather than so boxy? No. Negative. This is why I only function briefly as a boat. <laughs> <laughs> Everything functions briefly as a boat. Yeah. He are briefer than Lord. you think. <laughs> uh i feel okay i feel like the mechanism by which pego works is is sort of because i have uh as has been established pego has a sort of trap door hole situation happening which would trap air which would make them buoyant so it would make them what bu- buoyant 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 how do you pronounce that <laughs> i would say buoyant but also, I know Americans get made fun of for the way that we pronounce buoy um, instead of boy, which is so how... Boy- so buoyant is a thing that people are going to not make fun of anyone for. See, this buoyant. is the problem with yeah. being Canadian on the internet is that you see people making fun of Americans and half the time you get to join in and half the time you have to quietly withdraw. Mm-hmm. So when it's like, yeah, you know, these people don't have health care and love guns, you're like, yeah. That's that mm-hmm. dumb as hell. And then when they're like, yeah, these uh, people are uh, like 
they have oh, what's the thing that we do They're the same racist like oh they've got all, all their land got, from the native yeah. americans or they've got this tipping culture and i'm like who hey who, 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 who. <laughs> and then but then you run into things when someone from australia is like what's up with americans like the level of water in their toilet and i'm like <laughs> hmm i don't know i don't know where i stand on this <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and the sugary enough. bread too. I couldn't figure that one out. I'm still a little unsure. I think we have American style toilets, and I think we have American style bread. I think bread, as in like, like just normal. Yeah, like, apparently like American bread. bread is very sugary, and people. Who well, that was live the thing. Like, wasn't that the whole thing? That was the whole thing recently with Subway. How their bread can't technically, like, scientifically be classified as bread because there's too much sugar in it. I don't know if there's a scientific classification of bread. Sorry, we are we trying to describe how Pego floats? The genus, <laughs> the genus bread. Um, yeah. So I feel like Pego can create buoyancy. Can in in fleece can can increase. Pego can increase Pego's ability to float by it's it's a, it's a ballast situation. You just take more air into the hatch, and there will be enough floatiness to carry two humans and as long as the rapids aren't too rapid it won't tip over sideways like i would be fine but my people riding me might flip in all right maybe so. be generous to say pego has a couple of handles on its face <laughs> i like that you can hold on to there you go all right so i uh have been astride Pego since the moment they said the word boat. <laughs> I have been looking for an excuse to get this close to them since I stuck my leg leg appendage in their face hole. So yeah. I am so, so excited I, about this. I am imagining, uh, since we were looking for things to hold on to, I'm imagining the uh, the pegging arm just like slowly coming back out. Like, <laughs> it's like it's like being on the subway. Everyone's just kind of holding on to the, the, the pegging arm. <laughs> yeah. That's what I would have done. That's what Pega would have done if like their arm had not been bent but they're still hiding it so like because because i think both arms come out the front end of pego the jacket is covering the extremely damaged pegging appendage <laughs> and is probably being held in place by the only slightly damaged sampling of r2d2 appendage which that's kind of in the bottom area and the top area has handles for the human crew members to hold on to so All yeah, right. normally you might have some vertical appendage subway poles to hang on to, but it's like though it's kind of like the situation where you get on public transit or those have been taking and you have to hold a more awkward handle, like and you're like, oh okay. I guess this is what's happening. All right. So you guys get on boat pego. <laughs> and yep. and that's that's the plan here. Get on boat pego. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, boat boat of them get on. <laughs> now he's he's uh they are pego the pegging rowboat instead of uh robot. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. 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 There, 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 there it is row 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 your bot <laughs> <laughs> no can uh, i use my crutch to kind of like push you sure along? can yeah okay the current of the blood river is swift enough but you're able to add even more speed with your uh, your sort of uh, primitive oar, and you coast or what? quickly, uh, quickly but gently. Or what, Josh? Either or. <laughs> Shut the fuck either up. Or. <laughs> uh, you set down the river. And Are you using your pegging appendage as a rudder? <laughs> <laughs> kind of no, because that has been established. It's, it's, the peg, the all the, the appendages are facing up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. I, you know, it would have been very good design to put one appendage on the front and one appendage on the back in, in <laughs> for these boat type situations. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, but, that's yeah. I feel, feel like it's like, coming right in general for a love robot. Having an appendage on either side is probably just good practice. But. It probably is, and this is why the. The Pego model 
three is you know is is somewhat limited but when you get the pego model x it's going to be like a whole new world just eh? from from all angles just like biblically accurate pegging, <laughs> pegging robot that's right perfect so as you coast gently down the river you see machines pushed into the flesh that appear to be extracting the blood and pumping it upwards back towards the surface And as you continue further down the river, you see a bright white light, not something as uh, as warm and inviting as sunlight, but something cold and artificial. Yeah, I thought the jam is going to be more original, but I feel like you lifted cold and artificial directly from how I described some of the dialogue. <laughs> in this story, so. Is the, is cold the and light blunt. cold and blunt? Yes. Is, is the light blunt? Would we describe it? Yeah, we call it we call it blunt light. Mm -hmm. Oh, so. OK. I am detecting that this light source is at only five degrees Celsius and at 80% bluntness. <laughs> Do with that information what you will. Let's see, five degrees Celsius is like four. Oh, God. Four yeah, right. degrees Fahrenheit. This is one of those things 45? where you jump very yeah. aggressively on board against, yeah, what the fuck is with those people? And they're yeah, stupid people 40 degrees. degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Yeah. Don't get into any other measurements because I went to the doctor today and they're like, yeah, you're 85 kilograms. And I'm like, oh, I really should have internalized what that means, but <laughs> I kind of. I kind of needed in pounds. <laughs> so Canada operates kind of on like a mix of the two. We operate on the only possible thing worse than the imperial system, which is an inscrutable hybrid of the imperial and metric <laughs> systems where you walk 10 feet and drive 10 kilometers because that's just how it operates. Yeah. And also it depends how old you are because I had someone tell me recently, it's like, yeah, like you just go to the thing. It's like two miles down the road. I'm like, what the fuck is a mile? But that's what 50 year olds know. And I, uh, I've i lost my train of thought. I'm just Perfect. so angry about. Yeah. The so anyways, yes, the light is cold and blunt, as Pego so nicely put it. Affirmative. Yar, I think we should steer towards that cold, blunt light. It reminds me of me mother. <laughs> and then McGilstern, I must remind you that due to all my appendages do being on the deck side of the ship, if you will, that you with the as the holder of the crutch are the only one steering. <laughs> yeah, I, I agree. I, I'll do it. I just I you know, I heard that consent is important and I wanted to ask for the consent of, of yourself <laughs> and the crew before I, I bring you over there. What 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 be your thoughts on the on the matter? Well, as I have been programmed with the same libertarian training that the crew has been instructed on, <laughs> you must know well, Ensign McIlstern, that the key is to ask for permission to do the thing and then immediately do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps this is why you are still an Ensign and not an Admiral Captain. <laughs> Uh, so I'm I'm very embarrassed by being called out like this. So I immediately just start steering towards the the light. I don't even think about whether it's right or wrong. Pego quietly, you, like internally, how? feels proud because they have successfully negged the person they are trying to hook up. With. <laughs> how uh, how much of a choice do we really have about whether or not to go towards it? It seems like we're just kind of floating down. Yeah, it's like a down. ten foot wide river, so you can be <laughs> slightly to the left or slightly to the right, and this is crucially important. But yes, let's. Let's uh, let's keep this going. Uh, we must have a ton of agency. There's no way we're being railroaded. Not at all. No, lots of agency. Uh, as uh, you approach light, it gets brighter and brighter, naturally. But as you are almost blinded by the white light, you see a black hooded figure in front of the light. Tall, frail, thin. And... All of that upon a small mound of an island that the river ends at. Please update on what is happening. I have, <laughs> my sensors have been blinded by the light. 
<laughs> Wrapped up like a douche, another boner in the night. <laughs> I don't know why Pego got the lyrics wrong, but Julie, it's an indication that their systems might be failing from all the water damage. <laughs> water damage. Fucking <laughs> regular damage. Again, serving briefly as a boat. And <laughs> Wouldn't a love robot be like pretty waterproof? Yeah, but there's a difference well between there's a difference between getting wet and submersing well, yourself. Yeah, this this actually comes back to something that we discuss on the show sometimes. The difference between something being weatherproof and waterproof. If it's weatherproof, it'll keep water out. But if it's waterproof, it'll keep it out under pressure, like you would want for the hull of a vessel. So that I guess comes down to, uh, yeah, Pegos. Are, are Pegos you waterproof issue. or weatherproof? Correct. I am weatherproof and not <laughs> waterproof. And on the same note, I should note that I have all season tires, <laughs> which are not necessarily good winter tires. I mean, dread. I so, am so happy that we have a professional like answer to that question. Go on. So I think it explains it really well because like Pego is d clearly designed to get wet, but it's just there's. <laughs> There's layers there's of wet and layers. <laughs> there's levels to wetness and pressure that just they. There's a difference between a shipwreck podcast and a you know like a horny podcast. Sometimes, I don't know. We did we did do an episode on a boat called the Muff Diver. I probably mentioned that one before already, but <laughs> that was a that was a short one. Um, but uh, that was uh, the horniest one I think on the show so far. Well, we'll have to hope you uh, you get better, more horny boats in the future. Yeah, hopefully that schooner makes an appearance in your next episode. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm and if, if you're watching or listening to this, do your part. Do your part as a good citizen and go out and sink the horniest boat you can find to provide more content for them. <laughs> because, you know, it, if there's if there aren't any shipwrecks anymore, what are they going to record about? You know, if people mm -hmm. get too safe so you need to go out and actually do this kind of yeah this kind of uh we have content we have, based terrorism we have thought about that before it's like what if we what if we do this for years and years and years and we run out of content we're gonna have to start making our own <laughs> perfect start just sinking uh russian billionaires yachts yeah could do that so right now we have this dark figure that we're approaching is that correct yes and uh Pego, you are taking on blood at this point. Cannot confirm. I do not see the darkness or lightness of figures. <laughs> That's very progressive of you, Pego. Well, I am a fairly recent model, if not the newest model. <laughs> well, this newest model is taking on blood. So you guys notice that you're starting to dip a little bit as you approach the small little island. Okay, can I like crutch us faster you sure can uh i'm We're gonna get dipping. you to roll so like i'm actively though. losing my your boat water seat. tightness like am yeah. i actually okay so i am i am dying here i got an eight <laughs> you got an eight you are able to quickly paddle the pego boat to the shoreline before they take on too much blood and begin to sink i have a you question bump up just against a, it just a just a a uh a navigation question yeah. Is is the crutch being used as a paddle or as a pole, like on a keel boat? Are we pushing off the bottom or is this functioning as a paddle? Yes. Because <laughs> if it's a pole, then we could just probably get off of Pego and 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 wade. Yeah, I'd like island. to get off of on Pego, all right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Luckily, you'll never have to, to know the answer. The same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you'll never have to know the answer to that because you guys bump up against the island and are able to disembark safely okay, okay so they're able to disembark safely but I kind of bump up against an island and I'm just progressively sinking is that kind of <laughs> at the moment yes <laughs> yeah because they've, they've pulled me up from dry ground before while I was empty but if I am continuously filling with water I don't know if they're going to is it going to be as easy for them to pull me out of this water? Or am I too? I'm sure if they work together as a team and do a strength roll, they'll you know, be able to pull you out just fine. You know, something something I, I learned during my career is the Marines, they say, you never leave a man behind. But 
How does that apply to they, them, robots? It's actually immaterial because I was never a Marine, so I, I've never felt the urge to follow that <laughs> advice. Where exactly did you serve? I know this is maybe not the time as I am actively thinking, but I, my honesty module forces me to ask, what the exact circumstances of your military service were, Admiral Captain? I, I swore I would, never, I would never discuss this, but have you ever heard of the Gulf of Tonkin oh, incident? Oh, shit. <laughs> Searching memory banks. <laughs> memory banks have been damaged by unknown liquid. Please fill in. Yeah. I, I nod, like, knowingly. I'll, 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 keep it, I'll keep it as brief as possible, because I think we have to go talk to this gentleman first. Uh, but uh, I, I kind of started the Vietnam War. Um, <laughs> that was me. Uh, unfortunately, um, and it didn't it didn't end very well uh, for 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 me and my people. But uh, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, so let's let's go discuss uh, with this uh, eerie looking figure over here. As uh, as Pego continues <laughs> we establish to say, canonically what year it is. It is the year twenty <laughs> XX. <laughs> okay, so by that math. Um, the, the character of Whaleback <laughs> Willie has to be like 48 plus XX years old or. Yes. Okay. I think you're looking for, uh, for logic where there is none, especially when you continue to sink. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I cannot help it. You might say that logic is my white whale. I love logic and will stop at nothing in the pursuit of logic. All right, I'm going to roll a strength to try and get uh, Pego out of the water. All right. By yourself, no help. <laughs> and And the hooded figure is just kind of standing there watching us do this. <laughs> <laughs> I rolled an eight. You rolled an eight. All right. Um, Tanner, are you going to, is Will back? Will you going to assist with this or? I guess so. <laughs> uh, see my strength. I'm bad at strength. All right. So I've got my two, my two pairs. Well, good thing you have someone helping you who has like, I think multiple prosthetic appendages. Like. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I rolled a five and. A seven. All right, so you got to take the five because you're not good at it. And you said you rolled an eight, Nicole? Yes. You guys are, with great effort, able to drag Pego onto the shore, leaving a trail of the leaking blood that they were taking on, seeping from the small holes in its joints. Yeah, I think I'm going to probably uh, activate my drainage systems because... Given how tenuously they picked me up before, they're probably not going to be able to pick me up full of liquid as they've <laughs> exhausted themselves, dragging me out of the river. So I'm going to do them a favor by draining them, but I will still need help up, I think. <laughs> All right. So the uh, the hooded figure seems to wait patiently, although he has begun to tap his foot as the uh, fluid is drained out of Pago and you guys help write him uh, her, them again. All right. Um... So wait, this is like a hooded figure. Like I'm, I'm kind of picturing. And tell me if I'm wrong. I'm sort of picturing that, like Norm Macdonald Family Guy death figure, <laughs> like just a robe uh, that's floating. Like, do I see? Do, you see would any uh, of us? What does a figure look like? That's my question. Thin, emaciated, almost skeletal at this point, but still tough, leathery skin stretched over the bones. But they're robed. They are robed. Yes. So we can perceive their emaci emaciation through their robe. Like we can see their hands, I, yes. I assume, something hands like that. Oh, it's sort of like see, a yeah. bathrobe. We can see their head, their hands, their feet. You can't see their face, but you can see their hands and their feet. Okay, so that's why we see yeah. the feet tapping. Yeah. Okay. So yes. it's like hood up, but it's sort yeah. of like a Snuggie with really short arms and not quite covering the feet. Or like, feet. A, like an yeah. Emperor Palpatine type thing where we can see like extremities. We see the chin. And the hands. 
Did we see Palpatine's feet? I'm gonna go look up on DeviantArt Palpatine feet to see if anything I, shows up. I thought you were gonna. Ch- I thought you were gonna check Wiki feet for that. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a much better your joke. So I'm gonna repeat that and I'm gonna edit in. <laughs> hey, I'm gonna go look at Wiki feet for Emperor Palpatine. <laughs> nailed it. Absolutely nailed it. All right, I'm gonna approach the figure and say, I'm gonna go E R. Uh, where who be who be you and why what me? <laughs> <laughs> while figure, while this is happening, I am. No, I must I, say, <laughs> if at the expense of gushing a little, uh, Ensign McGillstern, I have always admired how articulate and well spoken <laughs> you are. <laughs> as uh, as that's happening, I am. I am positioning myself so that Helm McKeelstern is is directly between me and the <laughs> figure. Uh, tactical, very, very good. Uh, the figure thrusts a bony finger in your face, screaming, you damnable creatures, you've doomed us all. Uh, oh. Hey, when that happens. <laughs> I'm real sorry about that. <laughs> well, we must be going. <laughs> um, can I ask the figure who he means by we? Is there some larger we that he's referring to, or just us? You damnable know- creatures who opened the chasm and flooded this beast with all its essence that we have spent a millennia draining, freeing ourselves from the threat of its all-consuming maw, and you have drained it all right back in here. Oh, I go, Yar, well, that really seems to be like the natural way of things, so I can't say I feel too bad about that. You (laughs) You don't feel bad. You will feel bad when this planet emerges ready to consume all life in this universe. Well, this planet is now so fully do, operational. <laughs> this this could end up benefiting us if this is a sort of Roko's basilisk situation. <laughs> I am craving the sweet ob- oblivion of death, so I'm I'm kind of okay with this. Because what is death but one more hole to stick our leg appendages into? <laughs> <laughs> so true. Ah, uh, ah, uh, so deep, so profound. Um, I'm going to get all three of you to, uh, roll a perception check. Okay. And while we're in suspense over that. I got an eight. Eight. Get. Okay. Uh, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> uh, another snake critical eyes. fail snake eyes. Yeah. Uh, I have an 11. So that's good. All right. All right. So we'll, we'll go from, uh, top to bottom here. Uh, so whale back Willie. You spot behind the figure what that illuminating light is appears to be a sort of, uh, I don't really know how to describe this, a platform that has a floating, what appears to be a starship key floating behind it. And Helm the Kilstern, I love your name, it cracks me up every time. You see, although wound and bound in what appears to be tendons and muscle sinew, a uh, old starship. Pego, you notice what you think is the priest reaching for a weapon in its robes. Well, that sounds like a good time to get the fuck out of here. <laughs> um, okay, I, so I, I've, been, I've been stood up, right? Yep, yep, you've been stood up. So we're all standing here at the sort of the, at the pristine feet of this. Can you describe the feet of this character? We didn't ask you to describe the feet of this character. (laughs) Yeah, you sure didn't, and I won't. Okay, so then in that case, we're going to just put up this result I got for Emperor Palpatine feet. Oh, okay, perfect. And once (laughs) again, there's just no use to you if you're listening to this. We perfect, can confirm perfect. that Elper Palpatine does wear boots and such does not have visible feet. But as a bonus for the people who are watching and not listening, I'm going to put up this other result I got for Emperor Palpatine feet. 
uh, which <laughs> is attached to an, uh, an article that says Amber Palpatine has a foot fetish, which I have not read, but boy, am I excited <laughs> to read it once we're done this uh, recording. Uh. Oh, boy. That better be the, uh, the thumbnail, Kelly. Yeah. So I must confess I was not paying attention while I was looking up Emperor Palpatine feet. So <laughs> this this very impatient uh, robed figure who seems to have a lot of power to kill us um, has activated some kind of uh, battle station that is totally unrelated to a Death Star? Uh, no. He has said that you guys, by opening the chasm, have flooded blood back into the creature that they've been trying to drain for a millennia giving it life so, again so, so exactly see, like a death star we see the ship to be honest see, i was not paying attention during star wars either so <laughs> we see the ship we see the key and we see him reaching for a weapon well pego sees uh, the figure reaching for a weapon uh okay well i'm gonna run for the ship well i'm gonna crutch for the ship <laughs> i I know that Helm McKeelstern can't move very quickly, so I'm going to draw my cutlass and right. confront the hooded figure. All right. And what's, what's your plan here, Pego, since you see them reaching for a weapon? So I see them reaching for a weapon. So the, the ship, so if I can understand the spatial, so like there's us and then between us and the ship is this figure? Yes. And... Um, Helm McKeelstern has bolted for the ship. Yep, they're 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 legging it, and they're 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 pegging and legging it. They're pegging it. <laughs> yeah. And Whaleback Willie has sorry. Whaleback Willie did what? Drew his cutlass. I, I have I have drawn my cutlass to confront right. the hooded figure. And I am having to make a decision here. But like I don't see what kind of weapon is being drawn. I just see kind of like a hand going into like a, yeah, a, into the a lapel or a jacket pocket. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And I also see now looking up at the camera that my comb oh no, he's back. I'm good. <laughs> okay, so but I, yeah, so I don't see what kind of weapon it is. No, no, you just see it. I feel like I am f I want to believe in my ability to resist like both gunfire and blunt weapons. Okay. So, what about cold and blunt weapons? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why I said blunt because a sword a sword is not blunt. I meant to say like melee weapons, but there you go. <laughs> I just I'm blunt pilled. I'm always thinking about bluntness. <laughs> I I feel like the best course of action is like we're gonna do but good cop bad cop. So Whaleback Willie has drawn a sharp weapon. Yep. Or how how sharp is this cutlass? It's is it's it blunt? not that it's it's not that it's particularly uh, sharp. It's it's more that it's it's very rusty. You wouldn't want to get cut with it, uh, but it's it's not particularly well taken care of. So it it hasn't been sharpened in a bit. Okay, so while let me just simplify this. While Whaleback Willie has drawn a cutlass, which is clearly a weapon, I'm going to try <laughs> to solve this problem through the power of love. Okay. So I'm going to do my best to roll toward the hooded figure oh, as no. sort of the good cop here. You know, sort of like a yeah. mean cop, sexy cop situation. And okay. I'm I'm going to say... Mysterious hooded figure. Perhaps there are other ways to solve our differences because I am programmed in so many ways to love and I definitely have had no physical impairments in my ability do love and when you think about it if you don't want to do this the love way we can do this the cutlass way and i sort of like i try to do like a quick like motion to my partner but it's <laughs> sort of like a rotation on my <laughs> treads toward whaleback willie of like yeah this is this is your alternative all right so i need you to roll persuasion Hell yeah. How am I a persuasion? Oh, I'm bad at persuasion. How did that happen? All right. We're going full screen because the partial screen dice cam was not working. All Hell right, so yeah. So my bad nine. is nine. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. That's right. We are never All doing right. the split screen again. The uh, figure continues to draw what it was out of his pocket. 
And you see that it isn't actually a weapon, but instead... It's a new dildo for my... <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt you. It is a giant, thick, what looks to be a manual. And he holds it out to you. Oh, I understand your misunderstanding, but I do not need a manual. I need a vamual. <laughs> Boo. Boo indeed. He tries to step towards Pego and Whaleback Willie and attempts to grasp Whaleback Willie with his other arm. I am not having any of that. So I am gonna I'm gonna take a swing at that arm with my with my cutlass. All right. Uh, if you could the roll... manual holding arm, <laughs> no, the one that's reaching out for him. Oh, okay. I need you to roll a reaction. Ten. Ten. With a flourish that had almost left your weary world weary bones, you slice the arm clean off, and the man Ooh. shrieks and drops the manual onto the fleshy island you're all on as he drops to his knees, clutching the stump that used to be an arm. <laughs> Still Blood spurts everywhere. <laughs> he screams. I, I want to say my fools. now because I am the good cup. I want to look down empathetically as empathetically as I can <laughs> uh, without my empathy chip. I want to look down at this road figure and say, oh, no, you know, I understand it is a challenge to lose an appendage, but someone who isn't me has recently experienced injury to a very, very, very important appendage. And let me tell you, there is still life to live. You just have to adjust. And I attempt not to do the robot equivalent of blushing or... <laughs> oh, hi, Sasha. The man screaming begins to crawl... Towards... Are we certain this is a man, this road figure? Because we tend to assume in this group, not naming names, that a lot of figures are men. <laughs> His uh, cloak, like the, the hood falls off. You see it is a has long, stringy, silvery hair and a long, stringy, silvery beard. It is mm -hmm. undoubtedly a man who is, again, screaming in pain and horror and trying to drag himself towards his star vessel. So when you say undoubtedly a man, like what what <laughs> what makes a man to you, Josh? I don't think we have enough time to discuss that, Kelly. <laughs> In fairness to anyone listening or watching, Josh has been playing a lot of Hogwarts Legacy, so <laughs> yeah. If there's one thing I'm known for, it's my love of young adult fiction. <laughs> All right, so this guy is is wounded, uh, presumably bleeding heavily. Yes. Dragging himself laboriously towards the starship that Helmut Keelstern is arriving at. I feel like we should try to get on the ship before he does. Yeah, I'm already there. Yeah, so, okay, so Helmut Keelstern is already at the ship. Okay. Yep. And, and notices that there is a uh, a lock on the door with right. a, this, a key needed. This one-armed bandit... Um, <laughs> is like bleeding and very upset and crawling towards the ship. And, and Whaleback Willie has decided after severing the arm of this person to start moving towards the ship, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Both of so you neglecting I'm, the key. Right. Well, I haven't started moving yeah. yet. Yeah. So I feel like we've, in terms of the eternal, uh, the dichotomy of them, which is the good cop, bad cop. Clearly, we have gone bad cop. <laughs> so I don't feel like there's a big reason to maintain the, the kayfabe, if you will, of, <laughs> of good robot here. And as I am, you know, whirring toward the ship, I kind of just want to do that sort of like Red Dead Redemption looting of this body in front of me. <laughs> uh, because they've been like fully... If there's one thing I if there's one thing I and Pego have learned from Red Dead Redemption, it's that once you blow someone's limb off, they will just lay there and die. 
So nice. they're effectively a dead body, meaning I am going to try to loot them with what remains of my sampling arm All as right. I kind of roll over them. Uh, other than the manual that they had tried to pass off to you, they don't have anything on them. Well, if then I grab the manual. <laughs> the manual says, um, it's titled with, in the event of fluid returning, turn to page 69. Nice. Wow, what a completely ordinary page to turn to. <laughs> because Pego has not been programmed with that knowledge. <laughs> so, and because every sexual situation Pego ends up with is more of an 11 than a 69. So. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess since I'm back closer to it, I assume Pego's limb situation does not allow them to hold a book and turn the pages. Um, so I guess I should take that responsibility. I guess you should. All right. So I'm going to take the book and open it to page 69. In big red letters, it merely says, That's abandon really all hope. Luckily, I was not programmed with hope. <laughs> Is the guy still screaming through all of this? Oh, yeah, he's still, like, not dead. And still crawling towards the ship. I feel like we can't let that happen, and it was very rude of me to cut off his arm, and it would be even more rude of me to leave him alive to suffer. Uh. <laughs> I, I'm also kind of picking up on this, and I kind of realize that we've made a lot of assumptions based on the fact that this person has facial hair. And I say, uh, Dying human. I apologize for having not asked earlier, but what are your pronouns? All you hear is shrieking. <laughs> and I announce to the rest of the crew, uh, their programs are ah! and <laughs> and ah! <laughs> I feel like I may have fucked up the you did the timing you did. of my robot button. You, you We're just gonna take did. that one again. I have determined that their programs are <laughs> and <laughs> you fucked it up twice Is again. Is that better? I would never fuck up. <laughs> so, do we have the we saw we saw the key somewhere, right? Behind uh on like a floating platform or on the platform where it's like floating delicately as okay. if no gravity is there. So, where well, there was a floating key? Yeah. And you told us about this? Yes. Yeah, I don't think you did it. because I don't, I don't remember listening to that, so it must not have happened. <laughs> luckily, so, luckily, uh, well back Willie saw it. Yeah, I want to go grab the key while keeping a wary eye on the, the wounded, uh, formerly hooded figure. All right. So which, uh, which hand are you going to reach out for it with? Um, hold on. Which one is my... Um, I'm going to grab it with my left hand just to be safe. Your salad tongs hand? Yeah. That was a good call because as you put your, uh, salad tong hand into the light, you feel it heating up like it would have been a obscene amount of heat onto your bare flesh if you would have reached in with that hand. Yeah, but those salad tongs are durable. They have that They're crazy durable. silicone that's durable yeah. up to like yeah. 800 degrees. <laughs> and you t pluck the key from its floating mount, and despite all the heat that was in the light, the key feels cool to the touch. Okay. Did you say it feels cold and blunt? <laughs> Shut the <laughs> fuck up. <laughs> so I I know that Helm McKeelstern enjoys things like this, so I'm going to take the key to Helm McKeelstern and have them find somewhere to put it. All somewhere right. Somewhere to stick it, if you will. Well, Helma Keelstern has observed that there is a keyhole in which to push the key into. Yar. It's, I was built for this, and I, like, shake, kind of, like, my hand's kind of shaking. As I, like, this keyhole was made for me. <laughs> slide, the, slide the key gently into the hole, but I, like, kind of at the last minute kind of panic, and I kind of jam it in a little bit, but I... <laughs> yeah, and then I turn it. The, uh, ship's bottom opens up and a platform to step into the ship lowers to the to the three people or two people and a robot standing there. Uh yeah, I board the ship. I'm 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 gonna just uh 
the uh, rear guard for a second here, and I'm, I'm going to usher Pego onto the ship and just check and make sure our our armless friend is still staying a safe distance away. So assuming that Ensign McKeelstern has, sorry, I, me as a player, I'm not assuming Helm McKeelstern's rank. Assuming Helm McKeelstern has boarded the ship and is sort of out of earshot, and now that I've developed a sort of uh, mm -hmm. whispering rapport with Whaleback Willie, I wonder what it sounds like in this filter if I whisper. Oh, Whaleback Willie. Oh, God. I use your name and not your rank as we've become friends. It's awful. And... Well, we're committed to the bit, so we have to do it. <laughs> While I am normally accustomed to never leaving a gender non-specific human behind, I will proceed as instructed also due to self-preservation. And I, I just kind of roll on board the ship. Like, I've told Whaleback Willie that it's because I am doing it as instructed, but mostly it's because I'm horny for Helmut Gilstern. All right. I'm, I'm going to step onto the ship as well. Um, while, uh, holding up a, a middle finger to, to, our, <laughs> to the, to the wounded man shrieking on, on the floor as the, as the door slowly closes. <laughs> All right. In the, in the cockpit, uh, Helmet Kill. Ayo. You see that there are uh, autopilot coordinates punched in. I just start mashing Earth. buttons. <laughs> <laughs> I need you to uh I need you to roll, Nicole. You're just gonna roll bravery. I am very bad at that. <laughs> so I got oh, I got a nine and and a seven. Alright, so. In your flourish of pressing buttons, bravely going forward where no one shall, you somehow manage to start the engines up, and you feel the sinew and muscle that traps the ship breaking away as the ship activates its autopilot and begins to soar through the caverns, up through the chasm that you fell through, and before long, it exits the atmosphere. As you see from the back cameras, the planet slowly crumbling, seemingly from the inside, and tentacles bursting from the crust of the 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 planet. Looks like almost like a monster is emerging from the planet itself. Is there a nuke or something we can fire at this fucking thing? There is not. Well, okay. I look in the sort of spaceship equivalent rearview mirror of this planet and go, well. I am sure glad we don't have to deal with any of that bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> and then, scene. You guys ended life on the universe. <laughs> uh, it, you know, these things happen. <laughs> yeah, it is what it is. Yeah, yeah what can I you do, right? What matters most is that we, uh, we achieved a satisfying conclusion to this element of the story arc, regardless of what happens to people on the planet, there is some sort of end that we can attach to the beginning. And boy, is that ever hurdling a lowered bar for this show. <laughs> Tanner, do you want to plug your show one more time before we? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes. As you can see, I should note that Tanner has already been allowed to plug his Young show. Breakers <laughs> podcast. Shipwrecks lost. <laughs> Lessons learned from maritime disasters. I'm Tanner. That's it. <laughs> That's the show. Taylor's there too. We do it. Uh, we kind of 50-50 it. And uh, we do shipwrecks and we talk about other stuff too. Uh, oil rigs we've gotten into. Uh, we're getting into some... So we're, we're, we're branching out a little bit this, uh, this season. And we'll never do an episode about the Titanic. Taylor's existence is only rumored as far as I'm concerned. Born Under Punches is recorded primarily in a Miskwit CY Scully Cun 
in the traditional territory of the Nahiyuk, Nakoda, Nitsitapi, Nakawe, Métis, and other nations, also known as Edmonton, Alberta, in Western Treaty 6 territory. They were presented this week by Nicole McCoy, Kelly Gomo, Tana Johnson, and Josh Hans. Various social media links for the show and its performers can be found in the episode description, but BUP lives primarily on Discord. Join the official server to discuss the show, vote on the titles of future episodes, and submit your own weird erotica. Our theme song is Mr. Wormsley's Addiction by MC Lars. Other Creative Commons licensed media is used sporadically and is attributed in the episode description. Thanks for listening, and happy trails to you. How is everyone's pee break? Well, I use it as an opportunity to bribe Sasha over with treats. So. Oh, were you getting jealous because I have a bunch of cute dogs here? Yes, I was, actually. That's fair. Kova likes to sit right under the desk. Ryan says he does it during the day, too, which is pretty friggin' cute. Come here. Oh, there's a Sasha. Looking very unimpressed with life. Yeah, you don't want to be here right now. Hello, Sasha. Would you like to be stimulated? No, I don't think she does. <laughs> no, I don't think she does.